All right, good evening, everyone. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We're so excited to welcome Cookie Wolner in conversation with Dr. Beverly Guy Sheftal for discussion of the famous Lady Lovers, Black Women and Queer Desire Before Stonewall. Uh, tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Gay Johnson McDougall Center for Global Diversity and Inclusion, which is part of the Diversity of Equity and Inclusion at Agnes Scott College. We are very honored to get to work with them uh, in our partnership at Agnes Scott College, so thank you always for that partnership. I'm going to introduce Dr. Beverly Guy Sheftal first. He's a Black feminist scholar, writer, and editor who is the Anna Julia Cooper Professor of Women's Studies and English at Spelman College in right here in Atlanta, Georgia. She is the founding director of the Spelman College Women's Research and Resource Center, the first at a historically Black college or university. She has published a number of texts within African American and Women's Studies, which include the first anthology on Black women's literature, Dirty Black Bridges, Visions of Black Women in Literature, and so many more. Um, her A new edition of But Some of Us Are Brave with Stanley James and Frances Foster is out from Feminist Press. In a collection of writings, on the race gender debate during the 2008 US presidential campaign is also out um, with Janetta B. Cole from SUNY Press. She is joined tonight by Dr. Cookie Wolner, who is Associate Professor of History at the University of Memphis. So thank you both so much for being here. Thank you to everybody watching in person with us and watching at home online. Um, we were joking that Rachel Maddow is also in town. So we have like a little bit of a lesbian face-off happening, but we're, we're proud. We're proud to be here with all of you. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to kick it over to Dr. Guy Sheftal, but let folks know you can ask questions in the chat. And for folks who are physically here with us, I'll bring you a microphone when the time comes. But now sit back and relax and enjoy Famous Lady Lovers. So if you don't mind, we're going to be first named Cookie and Beverly. Yes, sounds okay. great. So let me first of all say, in addition to all of the things that he read, that I have been um, coming to Karis books since it was open at the beginning. When was that? 74. 74. I had uh, uh, come back to Spelman to teach in 71 and have been a Karis lover uh, from the very, very beginning. So I want to say that. And then I also want to say, in case people don't know, that Memphis, Tennessee is uh, my hometown, which is where Cookie is at University of Memphis. So we have that connection. Yes, I love that. And also, I was born in 1974. So um, I'm <laughs> oh, so, yes, this is only my, unfortunately, only my second visit to Karis, but I'm so happy to be here in the South's oldest feminist bookstore. So I'm, I'm thrilled. So and I'm so honored yes. to have you join me for um, this conversation. I'm honored to be with you. So in good feminist practice, I thought it would be really good if you just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes. Before we get to the book. Definitely. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. All right. So I grew up in the suburbs of New York. Um, I went to Hampshire College for undergrad in the early 90s. And um, it just gave me this like incredible kind of feminist critical background. I'm, I'm so blessed. You know, it was where I was introduced to like Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde. And my very first semester, I took a class taught by Fran White and Margaret Cerullo called Sexual Politics, Sexual Communities, which at the time I didn't even yet know was the name of a book by um, the groundbreaking gay historian, Jen D'Amelio, who's now like a mentor of mine. And in that class, I read um, the Eric Garber piece about the queer Harlem Renaissance. And it kind of like stayed with me for like 30 years. So I, I did an um, undergrad thesis on kind of on um, early fat studies work and kind of pick fat women's representation. And that's actually the period of my life when I learned about the blues women, the classic blues women like Bessie Smith and Ma Rainey and the ways they like saying about their sexual desires. Bessie Smith has a song where she talks about weighing over 200 pounds. And just as this like chubby insecure girl, it just, they, they blew my mind. So I, that's kind of when I first learned about them. And then I lived in San Francisco for a decade and I was a punk rock drummer in an all female punk band mm -hmm. and it was a burlesque dancer with other fat mm -hmm. women and um, just kind of working various day jobs. And then I eventually decided to go back to grad school. And then I kind of learned about the field of queer history. I didn't even really know that was a thing one could study. And I kind of remembered the blues women who I learned about earlier and that they were queer 
And you know, the field of lesbian history 15, 20 years ago was, was very white. And I realized that there's this important intervention to be made. And I really didn't know if it was my place to make it as a white woman. And so it was really due to the encouragement of mentors like Sherry Randolph, who I hope is um, listening today. Yeah, former student. <laughs> oh, and she was on my dissertation committee. So I, I love the connection here. Mm -hmm. Who encouraged me and supported me in the project and other folks like, um, like Dr. Rhonda Williams, who I got to serve as a postdoc in African American Studies at Case Western with. So they really kind of encouraged me. And um, yeah, so 15, 10 years later, ten, here's the book. So eventually we made it to this point. So before we get started, um, I want to just tell you this is one of the best books I've read recently. Oh, one thank of the best you. Academic scholarly books that I have read oh, recently. My. So I wanted to start by saying that. And we will definitely use it in our Black Queer Studies course at Spelman College. We are the only HBCU, not surprisingly, but unfortunate, that uh, has a uh, endowed professorship in queer studies. And we are working on our concentration in queer studies. And we've been teaching a course in, in Black Queer Studies for maybe two or three years. And so we will uh, definitely uh, use your book. And I will use probably one chapter in my intro to women's studies class, which I have been teaching now for 40 years. I am so honored. So I just wanted to uh, say that to you. Thank you. Uh, yes. So let's start with uh, what motivated you to write this book? And you've, of course, uh, said a lot about it in the acknowledgments, but mm -hmm. I want you to share that with the audience. And I also am not going to assume that everybody knows um, uh, what Stonewall is. Yes. So if, if, if you would just give us a little bit of history about mm -hmm. Stonewall, and of course, there's that uh, whole era has also been raced. So R-A-C-E-D, not erased. So if you say a little bit about Stonewall and then say something about what motivated you to write this extraordinary book. Yes, definitely. Yes. So um, although, you know, queer historians will tell you that there was many earlier moments of kind of queer resistance to police violence before Stonewall, um, we think of it as kind of this moment that kind of spurred the modern gay liberation movement, right? So it was just kind of a routine police raid on a gay bar in Greenwich Village, the Stonewall Inn. And, you know, it was just one of those nights where people weren't going to take it anymore. <laughs> there's, there's the one legend, I think it was that, um, oh my goodness, I'm spacing her name from Wizard of Oz, who had just died, the actress. Oh, yeah. What is her name? Who <laughs> played Dorothy? <laughs> Judy Garland. Yes, Judy Garland. Yes, Julie yes. Garden had just, yeah. there's this, there's kind of this urban legend that Judy Garland had just died. And that was like, just kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of like fighting back against the police. I mean, that's a little absurd, but um, it was just a, a night of police violence where queer folks started fighting back against the cops. And it led to like three days of queers and their allies you know, fighting with the cops in the streets. And after that, you know, they say the gay liberation movement was born, but I mean, also in reality, you know, the gay liberation front organization like formed right away after that. And this kind of movement began. So um, I think, I think especially since it's been, you know, over 50 years now, especially for younger people, that's kind of, that's old gay history, right to them. So, um, you know, this book shows, it's not the first to do it, of course, but it's, it's a book that shows that, you know, there was vibrant queer life long before Stonewall. Um, the title, is I, I'm glad they let me keep before Stonewall because it's really only about the 1920s and 30s. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I don't know. It just it just sounds good and it's, it's a good it's a good marker. So yeah, so I'm focusing on the 20s and 30s and just showing these like vibrant cultures that were forming, you know, several generations before Stonewall in an era where you know people didn't they weren't out in the same way. Right, the idea of being out of the closet is more of a contemporary notion. Um, actually, back then, it was more about coming out into the queer world. I don't talk about the uh, the drag balls in here too much because they were more of a space for, for men specifically, although not exclusively. But um, there was this idea then that like coming out meant kind of having coming out into the queer community kind of, you know, akin to like debutantes. And then, then later, I feel like coming out became more about coming out to the straight community or to your parents or, you know, at work. So I kind of like the earlier version of coming out. So what 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 uh, motivated you to to focus on black queer women in the twenties and thirties? Uh, and I really like the title, the famous uh, lady lovers, which I'd like for you to talk about. The title. Yes, yes, definitely. Yes, I mean, there's women in here like Gladys Bentley who like. I mean, there's no 
and white equivalent of, I mean, she was this amazing performer who's one of the stars of the Prohibition era who we kind of refer to her now as like a drag king or a male impersonator, but she's just a masculine woman who preferred wearing men's clothes often on stage. And she is one of the few people who really was kind of out of the closet mm -hmm. at this time. But I mean, she was someone who, you know, people came from all over to see perform. And yeah, there was really, there wasn't, I mean, there was, there was, you know, white lesbian spaces in, in Greenwich Village and in, in, in intellectual circles. But um, I mean, just the way the blues women were able to make a living in the entertainment industry. I mean, the entertainment industry for black women played a role that's quite different for white women. White women could, you know, do have different opportunities. They could work in an office, you know, they, they could do different things. Whereas for work, the working class black women I write about, if, you know, except for the few who went into the entertainment industry, they often had no choice but to do domestic work. Mm -hmm. So the entertainment industry became this really, really key site for them. And I mean, I was just, you know, so inspired by women who, you know, faced discrimination and oppression in so many ways and yet still chose to like go out on a limb and forge these queer relationships because that was, you know, that was, those were the relationships they wanted. I mean, I think they're just really inspirational, especially as we enter into another kind of more oppressive moment. One of the, I learned a lot uh, in this book. One of the things that I was a little bit surprised about was the um, sort of negative publicity, particularly in the black media about single black women migrating to New York in the 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite possible to read about that history as if everybody was happy that uh, black folk were migrating out of the South, particularly uh, black women to escape domestic labor. So mm -hmm. talk a little bit about um, the research. I mean, the very carefully crafted research that enable you to tell that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, originally the book was really just going to focus on the entertainment industry and the women in it. And then, you know, I kind of naively thought there would really be more sources than there actually were. But then I was very, you know, very lucky to do a dissertation in the time that we have things such as the ProQuest digitized database on black newspapers, which actually I had access to in grad school and I don't even have it at my current institution. So I, at my current institution, I couldn't actually write this book. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, I was able to read, you know, all the 10s and 20s and 30s um, copies of digitized newspapers like the Chicago Defender, the New York Amsterdam News, the um, Afro-American, the Baltimore, Baltimore Afro-American, just all, all these newspapers mm -hmm. and, you know, do keyword searches. And then, of course, those don't always work in coming across all these other articles. So I kept finding all these articles about kind of all, all women gatherings where, you know, allegedly like an act of violence happened, which was often seen as, um, you know, kind of a, a lesbian love triangle kind of situation, like two women fighting over another woman. And, and then within that, there was very interesting things. Sometimes there was, it seemed like, um, it's hard to parse, but it kind of seemed like they were saying at one time there was like two femmes like fighting over a butcher or a stud, right? These aren't really terms that were used, used quite yet. It was in more post post-World War II terms. Mm -hmm. But so, yeah, so I kept finding more kind of, you know, as we would say in history, kind of more like everyday women, you know, not famous women who, you know, I would try to learn more about them through, you know, look at look up census reports and things like that. Me and my grad school friends would pool an account for Ancestry.com and we would use that to try to find more information about folks. And occasionally we'd find a little bit, like I was able to find out some of the women really were um, Southern migrants, you know, I could find out where they were born or their, where their families were born and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, it was hard to really access too much about these these women. So the first chapter is focusing on kind of the um, the representations of, of violence between lady lovers in the black press, and it's more focused on kind of you know what the what the journalists are saying. They're always talking about how um, you know the police say that this is a new problem, but they never there's never actual evidence that like these women were in relationships. Some of them were just like women who lived together in boarding houses or rented rooms, and you know all living all all these kind of like new types of link, living situations for single women. So they kind of opened up possibilities for queerness. And it seems like that really can confuse people. <laughs> I was really happy that you outed Adam Clayton Power. Uh, <laughs> who, uh, uh, not outed as gay, uh, outed as, as a homophobe. Uh, uh, he, you know, can go down in history, for example, as being the person that tried to persuade Martin Luther King Jr. to abandon uh, uh, by, by a Russell. Wow, yeah. So we know about his... Um, homophobia as it related to Bayard Russell and the civil rights movement, but I, we did not know, I don't think we knew that he had a previous history, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, demonizing these queer Black women in very um, violent, verbally speaking terms. Mm -hmm. So do you want to say something? And, and, you know, of course, he's a minister before he gets to be a congress, congressperson. So there were 
mostly black male journalists, uh, black ministers uh, who um, were in your book at least. Yeah, the, and then the yeah. primary- uh, And then like black so sociologists also, oh, oh, right? Yeah. Franklin Frazier, yeah. who you know, was one of the ones that um, before, before uh, the black matriarchy thesis, mm -hmm. uh, Moynihan's black matriarchy thesis, he borrowed a lot from E. Franklin Frazier's uh, sociology that came out in the 20s. So, yeah. So, and then even right before that was Kelly Miller, and he's yes, the one who uses Kelly that term Miller. surplus women. This yes. idea if there's oh more men God. than women in the population, yes. they're, they're surplus women, right? <laughs> so, so it, it was, I shouldn't say it was stunning, it was predictable on the one hand, but I, I tended to think, I think most of us tended to think that this kind of homophobia came with cultural nationalism or black nationalism, which you point out in the 60s as opposed to the 20s or 30s. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised at what you discovered? Um, I mean, I wouldn't say necessarily. Um, yeah, I mean, it, the, the, so the, um, the Adam Clayton Powell speech he's referring to, so it's, it's one of the very first, I think it's 1929, it's one of the very first like anti-gay sermons that's given in a church and it's kind of focusing specifically on calling out women too. And it's, I mean, it's almost even just, it's like the language of, they don't use the term like groomer, but like all this kind of same, discourse we're hearing today, you know, you're hearing it back then, there's this concern about, um, you know, older women kind of creeping up on younger women and keeping them from from getting married, and concerns about, yeah, there being too many single single women in, in the North. Um, yeah, so definitely. And then, yeah, there's, then I also talk about some sources from um, Mar Marcus Garvey's newspaper, Negro World, which is more focused on kind of, you know, concerns about, um, yeah, if, if women just keep having relationships with women, you know, the race is going to die out. So mm -hmm. seeing them not just as like, you know, criminal or immoral, but like literally like a threat to the future of the race mm -hmm. specifically, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, what, was the, what, what was the impact? May, maybe Andrea Davis's book on blues women is the, is the text that maybe people have some familiarity with with respect to queerness. Mm -hmm. uh, did that book have a big impact on your work? Yes, definitely. Yes. No, I did. A, I did a master's at San Francisco State. I wasn't ready to leave San Francisco yet. So I like dipped a toe back in and I did a humanities master's program. And I was very lucky my first semester, I took this class on kind of music history with um, Christina Rudolo, who's a big mentor of mine. And yeah, she assigned that book that it, it had just come out. And I'd been out of, yeah, I'd been out of academia for like six or seven years and had come out in that period. And um, yeah, I mean, it was the way she talks about how they put forth like ideas of around sexual subjectivity and seeing them as like kind of, you know, this like legacy of, of feminism. And um, yeah, just kind of connecting, just the way she talks about how black working class women, you know, can be feminist intellectuals and put forth these really important ideas. And she talks about how on the blues, the blues women really like spoke specifically to female audiences. I love that piece. Like she talks about how in some song she'll they'll kind of say something like, you know, I want all you women to listen to me. And she's kind of the singers are kind of like giving other women life advice, you know. So, yeah, I love that. I I learned so much from that book. It was definitely a big inspiration for the project. One of the things that I say to the audience, uh, uh, even though the uh, book focuses on entertainers, uh, certain cultures in in Black Harlem, I was very happy that you included uh Lucy Slow and her her out partner uh Burrell. Mm -hmm. They were uh, on the on they were workers at Howard University. Yeah. And uh a very close friend of mine uh, uh she hadn't published it yet uh, was working on her dissertation on, on Lucy Slow and Burrell. So can you talk about Lucy Slow yes. and her partner Burrell? Yes. Uh, uh, Lucy Slow was the first dean of students uh, at a uh, HBCU. And can you talk about them and what drew you to them? Yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. So the fourth chapter is a chapter that um, I wrote post dissertation and I still feel a little insecure because it's kind of a common thing to publish your first book that was a dissertation in, but you like <laughs> add one new chapter and I feel like that's very much what I've done, but you know, no one would know unless I said that, but I, I still keep like calling that out about myself. But so, yeah, so in 2019, I got to go to, um, to go to Howard and do some research on Lucy Diggs Slow. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of a different milieu. I'm still, mm -hmm. I, I never still know quite how to describe them. Like not everybody in that chapter is middle class or went to college, but a lot of them are kind of more associated with like high society um, than than the blues women. You know, they're not, but it's even someone like still like, um, maybe not Lucy Dick Slow, but Alice Dunbar Nelson would go to a speakeasy. I don't know if Lucy Dick Slow uh, say, say who Alice Dunbar Nelson is for a minute. And, yes. And, okay. I'm oh, sorry. I, now I'm skipping. I'm just, there's so many women I want to talk about right. here. <laughs> <laughs> and people may have heard of Alice Dunbar Nelson because of Paul. Lawrence, but say yes. just a minute about him and then 
uh, slow. <laughs> she was um, she was a writer. She was an activist. She was a club woman. She she was a lady lover. She was yeah one of many women who tried kind of unsuccessfully, unfortunately, to have relationships with women while she was married to a man. And um, yeah, I mean she she mentioned some people. It's, it's hard to say if it's you know. It's just, it's still, yeah, a lot of what I do is dealing with the rumor. So I, I sometimes get a little clumsy with my words. I'm not quite sure how to parse things. But so she would talk about other other black club women. She would go out and like see a couple of women together who like played really important roles in organizations. And she would write in her diary how they were together. She also was one of the um, first black women to leave a diary behind that like mm -hmm. we've been able to, yeah. to use. So yeah, so we can kind of learn more about her inner life and her, you know, inner worlds than many of these women. But so Lucy digs slow. Um, was the first dean of women at Howard University, and she lived off campus with her partner Lucy Bur um, Mary, so Mary Burrell, who was an amazing playwright. I'm actually working on an article now about her and some other queer women who all did like anti-lynching because all the the first three anti-lynching plays were all written by queer black queer women. It's amazing. Yeah, wow. and she's one of them. And so they lived together off campus. But so this is the 1930s, and they're like in their 40s. But um, it's it's kind of a more like old-fashioned-ish relationship in terms of like um, you know, they're more kind of like a, we might call it like a Boston marriage, like two women living together, um, you know, who could afford to not have husbands, but you know, people didn't talk about them like as wives or girlfriends. They wouldn't you know they wouldn't be affectionate together in public. Everybody pretty much called them like sisters and best friends. But it seems like the men at Howard, you know suspected well, the president yeah yeah knew something was going on because they really they really tried to get her to move off campus to, sorry to leave her off campus home and live off, on campus basically they wanted her to live in a dorm like they wanted her to be like an ra like a matron you know wow. she was like paid horribly she was given very little money to like do programs and activities for all of the students but the student the female students at howard loved to go to her house and she, they would entertain in the backyard and like it was this really important black feminist intellectual space for them but um, so yeah, she's obviously existing in a, in quite a different world than Bessie Smith. But that's why. But I love how I show how there's these like amazing black queer women at this time, not only in like the world of entertainment, but also in education and other realms too. So I think it like paints a nice picture of putting them together. Did you find uh, anything you might want to read? Oh yeah, a little. Although it, like, it has nothing to do with what we've talked about so right. far. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> I always like to hear writers read there. Some of that work. I can do that. How how are we doing on uh, time in terms of what Q and A from maybe, the, maybe another ten fifteen minutes? Another question. All right, okay. I was just going to read two paragraphs. Okay, all right. Good. Okay, okay. So this is something a little bit different. Yeah. So this is and from tell us what page? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is on eighty four. This is in the third chapter. That's kind of focused on prohibition spaces. So it's kind of speakeasies. Yeah. This is going to be about a speakeasy, okay. and this is using some of the um the vice rec um, reports that. That I use. There's all these vice reports at the New York Public Library that um, you can kind of get all this kind of um, thick description from. As anthropologists like to say, of like details of. But you'll, you'll, I guess you'll just hear what it's like. I'm gonna. Do you want? Do you want to do it? No, no. Oh, I'm gonna do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. cool. okay. <laughs> well, you said earlier you might. So I was oh, just checking. I, I, yeah. No, I can do it. I can do it. Okay. <clears throat> I can do it if you want me to, but I didn't know where you're gonna start. Whichever you prefer. I think I can do it. Okay. <laughs> okay. When it came to queer patrons attending Harlem speakeasies, Eric Garber argues that, quote, gays were usually forced to hide their preferences, but vice reports tell a different story. For example, after going to the Elk speakeasy on 2454 7th Avenue at 1.45 a.m. on May 18th, 1928, Committee of 14 investigator, that's this like organization kind of invested, they're mostly looking for sex workers and they're kind of coming across queer, queer spaces. Um, Committee 14 investigator Ronald Claims wrote, and this is a this is a black male investigator who they hired to go into Harlem spaces. He wrote, while visiting here, eight colored women entered, all intoxicated, and ordered drinks which were served to them. They played the automatic Victrola and danced and danced among themselves, doing eccentric dancing, ballroom dancing, and ballroom dancing, which is very indecent. They patted one another on the buttocks and went through the motions of copulation. While Claims did not know who, if anyone else, was in the speakeasy at this time, the Elks was white-owned, and both black and white men and women patronized the venue. This report described what might have been an ordinary scene in which queer couples could enjoy each other's company out at a local speakeasy, just like any other neighbors could. That Claims did not record any men interrupting the female couples may have been significant, as Mabel Hampton recalled that going out in public meant tolerating attention from men who either did not know that you like women or did not care. For this reason, she much preferred private parties to spaces like the Elks. 
Music was another important element of the speakeasy, generating an atmosphere that enabled women to sensuously engage with one another through dancing. At the Elks, one could put a nickel in the electric phonograph. By playing music, customers generated additional profits for the venue, which gave the owners another reason to ignore the types of dancing or the makeup of the couples who took to the floor. While patrons could not select their own songs prior to the creation of jukeboxes in the 1930s, Harlem speakeasy phonographs were stacked with, blues, with popular blues records, and the such music was rarely played on the radio in the 20s. Going out on the town to drink and dance to the blues was further motivation for local queer women to venture to a speakeasy. Claims notes that the women of the Elks took part in, quote, eccentric dancing, which was a then popular term referring to a genre of dances like the cakewalk. Vaudeville performers noted for the specialty often perform gymnastically spectacular dances involving high kicks, twirls, and flips. Claims tries to use detached scientific language to describe the ballroom dancing that went through the, quote, motions of copulation, which was likely a dance called the slow drag. This popular speakeasy dance done to bl slow blue songs was very sensual as partners would hold each other in would hold each other and grind to and fro in one spa all night long. The female couples at the Elks were apparently acting no different than straight couples usually did in a speakeasy, and no one aside from claims seemed to care. Like the majority of Harlem speakeasies, white proprietors ran the Elks. But unlike in the larger and more established nightclubs, in these illegal spaces, Black and queer patrons could seemingly claim a presence. So, um, what do you, two things. When you've taught this um, material in your classes at University of Memphis, if you have. Yeah, I haven't taught it too much yet. Okay. But... <laughs> uh, I'm curious to know what it's like uh, in the classroom. Uh, tell me a little bit of like, like about your classroom. I'm assuming that it's a mixed classroom. Oh, yeah, very, very okay. mixed, yes. So um, what is it like teaching this material? I can imagine it would be challenging. Yeah, I mean, I really, I haven't, I haven't really taught my own material too much. I think in my first postdoc, I taught something I wrote, and it just seemed it was kind of it was kind of awkward teaching your own material. But I've like um, I was interviewed for a documentary on Gladys Bentley that I've shown to students before, and um, yeah, they they don't they don't really say too much, <laughs> and that's kind of across the board. But um, I also teach a lot of Gen Ed classes where not everyone necessarily wants to be there. <laughs> So, but so, but there's definitely because since I've been I've been in Memphis for seven years and in that time there's been like a lot more openness mm -hmm. to you know queerness there's a lot more visibility on campus so mm -hmm. there's definitely more people who are who are interested and um yeah I have also I have grad students and they're like incredibly supportive you know so what what do you hope in general um uh, how do you think that this book can really challenge the field of queer studies? And even challenge the field of of, of, of feminist studies. Uh, what can can scholarship like this? Because this the, this is outside the frame of queer studies, as you know. How do you? I mean, how do you see? Well, I mean, so. queer studies is mostly perceived to be white, mm -hmm. uh, and focuses on m maybe men. And one of the uh, ideas that we have to challenge is that queerness is something that black people learn from white people. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a, a dominant. Um, myth that um, Europeans even had the nerve to say that there was no homosexuality in Africa because primitive people don't have complex sexuality. And many cultural nationalists picked up that thing. Mm -hmm. The black people are not queer. Yeah. And if they are, it's because they picked up something decadent from white people. So uh, I would say that the, that the, the, that the uh, early scholarship in queer studies in the U.S. Uh, has been... Uh, not interested so much in in these racial narratives. Yeah. So so what 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 do you hope to that this book will do to the field of queer studies? Ooh, it's a big broad question. Uh -huh. I, I love being asked to to think so boldly and ambitiously. I mean, it's you know it's kind of putting black queer women in in the center of it. I mean, it's introducing them as you know central subjects in it who have played you know really important roles in in creating American culture in the in this time period. I mean. There's, yeah, they're they're so bold. They were able to kind of shape these lives. They were able to like travel the country. So I don't get into it too much here, but some of them were able to travel internationally. I mean, they, you know, they're bringing these cultural forms to people basically globally at this point. And also just the fact that women like Bessie Smith were, you know, so integral to the music industry specifically. I mean, they're becoming these 
huge stars at the time and yet still having to deal with like the dangers of like traveling through the Jim Crow South, right? They have to buy their own train cars so that they can like have some safety as they're traveling and they're, they're making all this money. Sometimes my rain would still have to like go through the back entrance to like record even in, in the North, right? So, and then like coming out of this like fancy car and having to like still use the back entrance, right? So, um, so yeah, I mean, I just think it's like, not to sound too cliche, but I just think it's a really important example of intersectionality. I mean, I, I've been talking about a lot. I'm teaching a grad women's, women's history class right now, and I keep kind of talking about my booking and bringing it up. And part of me is like feels kind of embarrassed about it. But also I'm like, not to brag, but like, I mean, I've created some pretty important new interne intersexual scholarship in the field that you guys are in. So you're honestly pretty lucky to be my students. <laughs> and a few of you might be listening right now. Hi. <laughs> I think it also disrupts the... The, the, the idea that uh, feminism was a politics that mainly highly educated, affluent, mm -hmm. middle or upper class women embraced, but yeah. then working class women, particularly working class women of color who were interested in survival, mm -hmm. didn't have a notion of feminism. Yeah. You know, there's stories here when, um, when Ethel, the performer Ethel Waters first meets her partner, dancer F Ethel Williams, she helps her get a job. Like one of them, I think, she, yeah, she's a dancer. So she'd hurt her leg at one point. She couldn't work. She she tells her boss, you know, can you hire her and you can pay me half of the money and the rest will go to her, right? So, I um, mean, yeah, I mean, if that's not feminism in action, you know, I mean, there's some, yeah, I love, there's, there's some stories in there that, um, yeah, I think they're very valuable. So before we open it up, what's your next project? Ooh, that is a good question. So when I did my job talk, I was hoping to do something on kind of um, the queer origins of rock and roll. Mm. But a lot of people have been doing that work since. So um, I'm not quite sure yet if there's an area within that for me. I'm working on an article, as I mentioned, about um, the first three um, playwrights who wrote anti-lynching mm -hmm. plays who were Black queer women. But um, I actually might go forward a little bit and do something a little bit more contemporary, like maybe something. I'm very, I'm very much a '90s, a '90s gal, so I might mm -hmm. do something '90s related. You know, something race, sexual, sexuality, popular culture, subcultural stuff. I'm not quite sure yet. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of in that like in that moment where I need to be figuring out the second project. So, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. So we <laughs> Thank will, you for asking, though. We will wait. So let's open it up to uh, the audience, and if you will identify yourselves, if you want to ask something, say something, that would be really good. And I don't know if you, we have any questions from the audience on the Zoom. Not meeting. on our not on our virtual folks yet, but we'll okay. give them a second. So uh, so let's try let's let's have some dialogue and, and tell us who you are, please. Hi, I'm Kate Rosenblatt, and I went to grad school with Cookie. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you. This so wonderful. And your mention of um, Alice Dunbar's diary and the fact that it is the only one sort of sparked a set of questions for me about the like methodological challenges of doing this kind of work, uh, particularly around like intimate lives and then sort of layered on top of that queerness, right, that was always sort of being surveilled in various kinds of ways. And so outside of that kind of, you know, that particular instance, like, how do you navigate the challenges of that? And, um, you know, is there, um, I mean, is there something that we should think about in terms of like, you know, that like section you read about the speakeasy and, you know, does it matter that the description is being filtered through the state and also through a sort of a male gaze? Um, and, you know, what does that mean for how you read sources about queerness from, people who were from outside the queer community. Yeah, so many wonderful questions. Thank you, friends. So um, yeah, so the issue of, of, of sources has been very challenging. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's so many different sources I use. I mean, you know, there's like blue songs can be a source. They're often written yeah. by the women themselves, not always. And of course, we can't assume that, you know, every song was, you know, even though there's, they're talking in the first person, it doesn't mean they're talking about their own experiences, mm -hmm. right? But you know, there's still something that I can read there. Um, there's in the in the fourth chapter, um, I talk about the actress Edna Thomas, who um, had a husband and she had a girlfriend. She had this British girlfriend, and um, some sleuthy historian before me figured out that the two of them anon anon anonymously recorded um, sexology case studies for um, I can't think of the name of the doctor, but in this book called um, oh, George Henry, in this book called Sex Variants, and this book has all these incredible. Um, case studies, several of them feature black queer performers. And there was actually um, a white lesbian who had the um, 
She went by the name Jan Gay, and she apparently she did. Yeah, I've I'm so in much debt to Jan Gay. She assembled basically all the queer women for this book to be interviewed. But yeah, this is these types of sources are exactly getting into the questions you're raising, right? Because we don't really know. So these are you know people who are basically like, oh, why are you queer? Tell us about your childhood. Like, tell us how you have sex. And this book even has like these elaborate drawings in the back of female anatomy. Um, yeah, it's a it's a little bit racy. <laughs> But um, so, so yeah, we don't know if they're really like telling the truth because, you know, some of these women are telling pretty wild stories. You know, one of them talks about like having a very like large clitoris, for example. And you know, sometimes you're just kind of like, oh, are they just kind of like creating the fancy that they think these people want to hear? Or like, is this, are they kind of, you know, just kind of for, bearing their souls? And I also don't know if they told the story to, you know, a lesbian or to this male doctor or, you know, to a white person or a black person. Um, so, yeah, so that's very much, you know, another very, a very mediated kind of outs outsider source. I talk about, you know, it's not original to me, but I talk about just kind of reading sources, you know, against the grain, kind of finding information from them that wasn't, you know, that's, it wasn't, what the creator of the text had in mind, but like I can kind of mine them for things like, like how these newspaper accounts about violence against um, about violence between women would always tell everybody's name and address. And so I could look look up and see where people live, for example. Right. So um, but yeah, so there's very few sources, like I said, that are like the 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 diary. Um there's also most of the blues women have like um either biographies or sometimes autobiographies, but they're often, you know, like written with somebody, as is often the case with celebrities. So um so yeah, it's 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 definitely very, very challenging to to parse these sources, especially also like the um the ones I just read from about the the um the vice reports, right? Yeah. You know, that's a really great point how it was, it was, they never would hire, you know, a woman, much like a white woman, much less a black woman to go into these spaces. So the only spaces he could go into were the ones where a man would be invited. So he couldn't even go to like the real queer underground women's parties, right? Because a man would never have been let, let into them. Yeah. So there might of course been these whole other worlds that, you know, we can't access. Was there a musician or a figure that you discovered that you now just want to like proselytize mm -hmm. about? <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you that. <laughs> I mean, I guess I already talked a little bit about Gladys Bentley, huh? I didn't yeah. talk about her too much though. Mm -hmm. Like she, um, yeah. So, so the um, yeah, white gossip columnists in, in New York like loved her and would always write about her, and so that kind of drew all these you know white slumming crowds to go out and see her perform. And um, she was known for kind of flirting with all the women in her audience who would have mostly been white because, you know, a lot of the clubs she performed at were spaces that were more kind of um, spaces that were only welcoming white folks into the audience and black people just, you know, work there basically. And, you know, this is, this is more mainstream places, you know, like the Cotton Club and the Plantation Club and all these places with these horrible, horrible names. Right. Um, but so she, when, one day, um, the, um, this, I can't think of his name, but this white male gossip columnist says that that Gladys Bentley comes up to him and she's like, I'm getting married, come to my wedding. And he's like, who are you marrying? Oh, who's the guy, who's the lucky guy? And she was like, what? She was like, I'm marrying a woman. And so she allegedly had a, had a wedding in Atlantic City. Yeah, so that's not the type of thing I've been able to find any information on. But um, this woman named um, Mabel Hampton, who did these really important um, oral histories for the lesbian history archives talks about other similar cases she knew of black women basically having marriage ceremonies in 20s and 30s Harlem and oftentimes there'd be you know it's kind of be a, a butch femme dynamic and sometimes the masculine one would be able to pass as a man and they literally get like get an actual marriage certificate like with a you know a different name on it so um so I wouldn't be surprised if that actually really happened to Gladys Bentley but um yeah you can you can find some of her songs online and she once there's only one tiny bit of video footage of her, she performed once on a kind of a Marx, Groucho Marx type of um, talk show, and there's some footage. And also, actually, I was in a short documentary on her for the um, Unlady Like 2020 series, and you can watch it on PBS online, too. <laughs> we do have a question from online. Um, this is from Sam Guajardo, I think. Oh, that's one uh, of my students. Hi, Sam. Awesome. Uh, amazing discussions from both Dr. Wolner and Dr. Guy Sheftal. My questions are, one, where do you see queer studies heading in the future? And two, what can we do to continue to promote the diversification of queer studies? Great question, Sam. Um, I mean, a few places it's going that I'm excited about is there's so much more, there's so much more coming out in like disability studies. And fatness, which I think is really, really exciting. Um, 
yeah, that's one that's one area. It's, and I think people are doing more kind of like transnational and, and global work too. I see a lot of at least ads for for jobs for people doing that type of work. So hopefully there's people doing it out there to to get those jobs. So um yeah, just really kind of going beyond the U.S. framework seems to be you know an important direction folks are going in. Um, what do you think? Hmm. I don't you know. I think queer studies has a long way to go yeah. in terms of in terms <laughs> of uh, uh, transforming itself. I mean, when when I think about how long it took for women's studies, yeah, to transform itself. I mean, you know, now intersectionality is you know a core uh, concept in in women and gender studies, but that was not the case. Yeah, um, I, I took my first women's studies course as a graduate student at Emory University, and um, and I, you know, went around the U.S. Uh, as a review of women's studies programs, and it took a while. Mm -hmm. It took a while for 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 women's studies uh, in the U.S. to become global, even yeah. to become global, uh, to become um, uh, focused on intersectionality and not to privilege gender. So I think maybe I hope it won't take as long for queer studies. Yeah, but uh, I mean, what do some of you think? I mean, I, I, I still look at a lot of queer studies syllabi that are white and U.S. still. Yeah. And, and, and I would say very uh, masculinist even. Um, I wanted to answer your question, but I also had another question. Um, that's something I've thought about a lot too, particularly with, um, there's a, I feel like there's a, there's a, a movement of queer people who were raised in the Christian church mm -hmm. who are kind of responding to that and, um, you know, leaving the church and responding to that publicly. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that is very highly centered on white queer folks or um, if people are black, it's black men, mm -hmm. um, black gay men. And so um, that's something that I've thought about for a while, how there's, when it comes to um, the, like people responding to the experience of being queer and growing up in the church and having that, um, that like inner conflict, the, the voices of black queer women are left out. And um, I don't know, that's something I would like to see a lot more of um because i feel like it's one become a lot bigger with the with the political climate um but also i think that's that's a huge part especially with black people in our relationship to spirituality of all kinds um i would i would love to see more of that in queer studies tell us who you are oh i'm kamaria <laughs> beeman uh I'm a social worker and grant writer, um, also queer black woman. So thank you so much for coming out. Yeah. No problem. Um, I have another question. Well, a question. Um, so the, I'm thinking about what you said about the different sources and how like a lot of them were like filtered through other, you know, people and weren't direct sources. And um, I think a lot about now where like, because of social media in a way, everyone can archive themselves. Um, and I think that for me personally, during my, my journey for coming out, social media and seeing images and other people tell their stories on social media was very helpful for me. Um, so I wanted to know like, what are your thoughts on like, when this work continues and we're studying like, you know, contemporary times and queerness. Um, Cause I feel like there's a lot that's out in the open that people are saying directly from sources, um, especially in Atlanta, this being a very uh, queer friendly city. Um, for the most part, I won't get in that, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like, I guess like, what do you, what do you think about that process? Like where it goes as far as like archiving and, evidence and all of that for when this time is being studied now. Ooh, 
Wow, you're asking a historian to think about the contemporary moment and the future. All right. <laughs> yeah, no, wow. Um, I mean, it just seems like an overwhelming amount of, you know, content and data and, and information. It's, I, I can't even imagine how people are, are going to parse it. I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, but yeah, like you were saying, I mean, it's, it's amazing that people can, you know, kind of create their own archive of their own lives and, you know, it won't be, it'll be kind of the opposite problem really of having like, instead of having not enough material, it'll be more kind of like you have this massive abundance of it and how to kind of, you know, go through it and, and organize it or, or find what you're looking for. Right. So it seems like it's still a challenge, but kind of like the opposite of the type of challenge I had working with sources a hundred years ago. Yeah. I mean, do, do other folks have any thoughts on that? You know, one of the um, challenges, I think, while there's social media, the, the other thing that I'm thinking about, I don't know that people keep diaries anymore uh, or keep journals or write letters. I mean, those 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 were rich sources yeah. of, 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 of material in the past. And so I wonder what it's going to be like being a historian, um, a contemporary historian who doesn't where, 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 where social media might be the only thing that's there. And, and, and I think that misses what you get in um, diaries, journals. I mean, I think about, you know, Alice Walker's journals. You know, she's been keeping a journal since she was 12 mm -hmm. and writing letters. And so I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah. Of, so, so it may be actually even as challenging, but for a different set of reasons. Totally. Of course, when you said diaries, the first thing I thought of was, um, I didn't actually use it. I think some, I'm Gen X, I think some Gen Xers use it, but mm -hmm. I think it's more of a millennial thing. Um, Live journal, right? That was like the really popular online um, thing where it was, so basically it was just like keeping a, a journal online. And in the 90s, I used to do like little personal zines. I was part of the, the little riot girl movement. So I mean, that was basically like another form of like keeping keeping a diary, right? But it wasn't, it wasn't digitized yet. So um, yeah, I mean, people, you know, yeah, sending text, sending, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, so, it's so immediate, right? You know, like mm -hmm. writing somebody a letter, telling them what you've been through. People don't send, you know, emails and texts like that. It's just not the same type of communication. So, yeah, it is, it's kind of sad to think about it like that, the way that type of information is, is kind of lost. I mean, this is on a different subject, but I was reading a letter that um, the person who wrote Invisible Man. Um, oh, God. It was a 10 to 20, it was a, 10 to 15 page letters you wrote to somebody. <laughs> I mean, that's just, that's not, that's not, that's just not going to happen. That's not going to happen. I mean, quick, you know, quick emails, um, I think are going to make it challenging for contemporary historians. Yeah. It reminds me actually, yeah. So when I was, when I was at Howard, I looked, she only comes up a few times in here, but I might talk a little bit in passing about, um, Angelina Weld Grimke, yeah. who someone who like wrote a lot of amazing lesbian poetry as it's referred to now, but didn't actually have any known relationships really with men or women. Um, but she, I got to actually hold like a love letter she wrote as a teenager to mm -hmm. another girl from like the 1890s. And it's the type of thing where like, you know, I've been reading about these types of letters and relationships like for 20 years, but I never actually got to hold like the actual letter in my hands. And of course I, I had my little gloves on because I was in the archive, but I still actually got to hold it. And I'm, yeah, I, I think I, I definitely got a little emotional about it. <laughs> and I mentioned one other thing in that regard, Lorraine Hansberry, you know, who read Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex. And, she, and unfortunately the book is, we don't know where the book is now, but I remember going to her home and pulling that book off the shelf and she has notes throughout the entire book. We, you, oh notes, handwritten notes mm -hmm. throughout the entire book. See, that's not, that's not going to happen. Right. Yeah. And, and, and just, just imagine what, you know, people used to do that. Mm -hmm. Used to literally uh, fill up a book with notes. And so, so that's going to be uh, lost. That's true. Any other questions? Are we out of time? Mm -hmm. Um, this is for Tell both. Tell us who you are. Oh, I'm <laughs> Kiki Carr, uh, not an academic. Um, I was, old, old friend from San Francisco. Yeah, uh, also Gen X. <laughs> um, I wanted to get both of y'all to comment on um, any of the movie representations of the people from the book, for instance, Ma Rainey, that have come out recently, and how realistic or what was omitted or et cetera. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I think I think probably my favorite one would be um, I do love Queen Latifah and Bessie. I thought that one was yeah. was quite delightful. Mm-hmm. Um, and then yeah, there was the recent there was the Netflix movie about um, yeah Ma Rainey's Black Bottom mm-hmm. with was it Viola Davis? Yes, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean well, that that's based on a play, and um, I think unfortunately, I mean I think now that that's out, I feel like people are going to kind of be like, oh, well, a movie was made about Ma Rainey, mm-hmm. but Ma Rainey's not actually like that's the play's not really like kind of about her that much right so i think that's like a little bit of a loss because i think she totally is still deserving of like mm-hmm. a film focusing just on her so um so yeah um she's someone who we just really know about her having relationships with women in terms of rumors and some you know she wrote some songs about it too i talk about in the book and there was a rumor about her having this kind of racy time with some of her chorus girls that gets broken up by the cops once mm-hmm. but um but yeah so she has she she basically kind of has a girlfriend in the film. So that's, you know, that's pretty like fictionalized, but I mean, you know, who knows? I mean, that, that could have been the case. Um, so yeah, but I, I still, I mean, it's an important play and I, I, I love that it's out there and that's just these representations have been out there more and that people have been learning about these women, but those are, are those the two main ones you had in mind? Those are really, yeah. Yeah. Sure there's yeah. Well. yeah. Have you seen either of those? Yeah, I've seen those, and I and I agree about those. I, I mean, if we come to Stonewall, there is a, a film on Mar- on Marsha Johnson. Oh yeah. Oh, there's that um there's that that yeah. Netflix one. The Netflix one, and of course there's Lorraine. I'm just thinking about Black queer women. Yeah. There's Lorraine Hansberry one. So not a lot, but yeah. you know, if we if we come up a little further, there's there's those two. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, I, I was thinking this would uh, this would make a good documentary. I it, think so know, too. You know, How should I get started they, on that? Right, they, in, uh, <laughs> uh, the the in, you know rather than to focus on all of them, but to but to use the thesis of the book and have and have all of them in a in a documentary. You should mm-hmm. pursue that. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Sam has a comment. Um, I I enjoy when historians unearth diaries and use those in, in their research. I think historians are going to start unearthing Finsta's fake Instagrams <laughs> and <laughs> I can't even say fit fit us, <laughs> fake Twitters in the future, privatized online forms of social media. Um, so that's an interesting point about yeah. future archives mm-hmm. for sure. Um, well, one of the things that we like to ask to kind of close us out um, is, you know, we think a lot about sort of curation and the shelf that you are on literally and metaphorically with other people. So are there any authors or books that you'd like to shout out that in your dream world, you're on the shelf with them or literally kind of, you're like, my book belongs next to these, these books, because I want you to read them in community with these books. Ooh, that is wonderful. My goodness, my friend Jennifer D. Johnson's book just came out, but I'm spacing on the name. It has affinities in it, but it's another it's another book that just came out on UNC Press, and it's about kind of the interaction of um, civil rights and LGBT politics starting in the '60s. So, um, yeah, but I don't even I can't even think of the full name right now. So that's not helpful. Um, <laughs> Jennifer Johnson. Jennifer, yeah. Yeah. Jennifer. Yes. Say it again. Ambivalent. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Ambivalent Affinities by Jennifer D. Johnson. And it just came out this week, so you might not have it yet, but you should definitely get it. And I'd be thrilled to be to be next to her. You got any ideas for Cookie? I, I would I would I would still say uh, the Andrew Davis book, uh, a blues. I can't remember that. Blues. Yeah, Blues Women and Black Legacies. Is a, is a is a companion mm. uh, volume to this, and and I, and I don't know. It, you know how if people know Angela Davis's that book, they may know the the, the right, the, yeah. It's a departure than what, raising yeah. class, and they may know the Palestine book, which people should definitely read. Oh yes, uh, but they may have forgotten about Blues Women, and 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 she's got a new introduction to her autobiography. But Blues Women may have fallen through the cracks. So I yeah. would say this is a sister. That's a sister. Cast. Well, I'm I'm so honored. Thank you. Yeah, that came out in the '90s. It's really wonderful. And she also transcribes a lot of the blues songs too. And yeah. that has been really important to me. Those transcriptions also, because sometimes we don't always know the lyrics. So That's right. yeah. All right. right. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you so much. We want to let folks know who are watching online that you can click this teal button to buy the famous Lady Lovers from Karis really does help us when you buy your event books from us. So thank you for doing that. Thanks for being with us. One thing you can do is request that your local public library or university library carry this book. It helps authors when you do that. So please consider using your voice in that way. Um, Authors always appreciate it. 
And uh, we hope that you stay safe and well. Thanks for being with us.